access the podcast of OA, located deep within Sector 14845 and powered by the Emerald Light of Will. The podcast of OA is your guide to the Green Lantern universe. Hosted by Lantern Myron Rumsey, the podcast of OA begins now. Hey, Green Lantern fans, welcome to the podcast of OA, episode number 226. I'm your co-host, Myron Rumsey, and I am joined by my friend on the other end, Phil Bova. Phil, my friend, how's life? Everything's great, man. Everything's great. Lots of Lantern news uh, kicked up uh, today in the, in, the, in the storm of everything coming out this year, and uh, I'm liking it, man. It's fun stuff. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, we all obviously we knew about Green Lantern War Journal, but today, uh, as of the time we're recording this, uh, DC released the official blurb for it, and uh, it, it lines up a lot with what when we when you when we interviewed Philip Kennedy Johnson here in the show, he talked about it. You know, it's going to be '80s movies. You know, he made allusions to Aliens and Predator and Terminator, and so what we saw today was was very much confirmation of what he had already told us. But it was good to see it come out. We have a release date. First issue comes out September nineteenth. Uh, interesting, they did not refer to it as a limited series, which was originally what they thought. And, 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 you know, I remember when we talked to to Johnson that he had said that kind of thought DC was thinking it was going to be an ongoing, but he wasn't sure if he'd be able to do an ongoing based on all of his other commitments. But we know at least he's in it for the short term. Let's hope that he's in it for the long term. I'd like to see him develop a character like that, especially over the course of a good 12 issue run. You know? Right. And and we don't know how long it was going to be as a, as a right. limited series, but... Right, you can flesh out a lot, and Johnson's good with it. I mean, his his Superman's really, really, really great with that. And I have a feeling if he does John Stewart like that, and I'm not even a John Stewart fan. That's what's funny about this whole thing. But I'm looking forward to it, and I'm looking forward to delving into it since Johnson's taken over. You know, I've, I mean, I've dabbled in it to Stewart in the past, but he's not my favorite. I mean, I'm, I mean, I've always liked him, but I, he's never been like. Oh. I'm hoping that. um Johnson really defines John Stewart well because I think that's what's been lacking is he's he's really been a supporting character and not had enough of things fleshed out in a way that the character should have. Sure. So that, that's what I that's what my hope is for it. Plus, I hope it's just a great, great, great story. I mean, we're gonna have two Lantern books, so I'm not gonna complain. Right. Well, and and then we'll have a third because there, there's yeah there's that Alan Scott book coming out later this mm-hmm. year too. So. It, it, that one is a limited series, but you know, it'll be good to, to have some more, you know, I, I, I'm excited. You know, if, if, if things continue to be on the upward swing that they feel like they are, I can't imagine we're not going to have a third ongoing at some point. Well, for the most part, I mean, if you, if you, if you read the temperament about, about this book, I mean, the first book got good reviews. I mean, hey, from, oh, yeah. what I, from what I've gathered and the second book, I, I, I think is just as popular. I mean, I haven't heard any shade thrown at it and you know, I don't, I don't, I don't follow a lot of people on Twitter, but I know that the ones I do and the ones that, that retweet stuff that they follow, I haven't seen any negative comments about this book at all. I've seen just a little in in some of Hal's actions uh, being cringy uh, and and I get it. And when we start talking about the book, we'll get into that and, and we'll also do a segment on, why I think he's doing it, doing it. Uh, but there, there's a little bit of that. Some people are saying, yes, a retread of the John's run. But I'm like, you know, everything's going to get compared to the John's run, right? Like, just like everything used to get compared by to, to the hard traveling heroes there for a while. I'm and not the buying book, it. No, I'm not, I'm not buying that whole, it's a retread of the John's run, man. It's, yeah. it's got a different taste to it. The, uh, the first issue sold really well. It, it was the number three book for DC for the month. And it was in the top 10 overall. So that's that's really good news. Obviously, we know that it depends on how the things go over time. You know, the first issue always has a sales bump. But we'll see. It's, it's got some good energy behind it. So I'm really excited for that. Uh, other things, I'll do a couple, a couple of shout outs. Uh, I know you've got one and I've got one. Uh, I just want to give a shout out to the Martin O'Dell family. They launched their store and they sent me a piece of artwork it's a print by Martin O'Dell, but it's 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 signed by him. It's an authentic authorized not authorized. It's an authentic signature, which uh, I I'm just I'm flabbergasted and very honored and humbled and 
um, the thank. So if any of them are watching your, this or listening to it, thank you very, very much. I, I greatly appreciate it. I know they're watching. I know they're listening because they, they comment to me when I get a text every once in a while. Oh man, listen to the latest cast. Love you guys. <laughs> well, and, and, and they have the online store going on and you can get some of this stuff. There's stuff that's unsigned and there's stuff that's signed and the opportunity to get something signed by Martin Nodell is huge because you know he, he's not around anymore. So there's only a limited number of these kind of things left. And mm-hmm. and besides the uh the Alan Scott print, there is behind here. I don't want to damage it because I get I gotta get it framed, but there is a print of the Pillsbury Doughboy. That's really cool. Yeah, so cool stuff. And, and there was a button as well with that, but that's cool. Uh you you yourself received a, a, a package in the mail. I did. I did. Let me see. I'm going to bring it out. Here it is. Here it is. Here it is. Booyah. Green Lantern Rebirth signed by Jeff Johns. That's big great. shout out. Yeah. Big shout out to David, man. You know, the guy, you know, I was kind of taken aback when he texted me and he was talking about it or mentioned something alluded to it. And, you know, I didn't think anything of it. And then, you know, he starts sending me pictures. All right. It's being FedEx. I'm like, okay. <laughs> Well, and it's just, you know, yeah. it's, it's, it's very nice and it's very humbling. And uh, it, it's sometimes it's, it's, it, it's hard because we greatly appreciate it, but we, we're not doing anything special. We're just, we're just two guys talking about comics that are trying to provide content for our fellow fans. And if people appreciate it, I, I'm thankful for that. That means mission accomplished. I mean, yeah, I mean, then that's just it. David, and David's been, you know, he's just a nice guy. I mean, chatting with him on Twitter and then, we, you know, we sometimes send text messages back and forth and he wrote a really nice note with it, which, by the way, I should show you the the cover of the card, which I thought was kind of cool. Um, but yeah, a really nice note. Um, you know, just, it was really cool. It made my day. I was, I think it was new, I think it was a uh, new comic book day because I was going up the, apotheosis to, to pick up my pulls and uh that ended up coming later on i was telling martin about it when i was at his shop and him and i were chatting about gi joe stuff and everything but yeah thanks david man i love it appreciate it i know clark got a kick out of it too not that he knows anything about it <laughs> he will someday <laughs> very cool well you and i have a comic to talk about a really good one we do, and it feels so good holding these holding these hard copies. Yes, so. it does. It does. And we're gonna do we're gonna do two segments. We're gonna do a, the review in our normal conversation, but uh, there there's a theory that Chad and and I have both formulated in our heads that there's some reasons why there's some unusual things going on, and I want to talk about it and get it out there, but I also want to be cognizant of the fact that sharing that theory might spoil it for people if it is true because it's a theory it's 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 all conjecture and it's it's one of the things i love about comics when there are things like this where they're planting seeds is i like to speculate and it's all speculation could be completely wrong but if it's true it it, it it's a big shakeup thing and i want to do that as a separate segment because i want to i want to be respectful to the listeners who and viewers who may not want to hear it so we'll do a second section for that so for this time around we're going to skip the know your course segment and we'll just talk about this book and do the other section and wrap it up from there all right sounds great to me all right well let's take a quick break and we'll come back and we'll talk about green lantern number two this is John Carlo Volpe, producer of Green Lantern, the animated series, and you're listening to the podcast of Oa. All right, friends, we're back to talk about Green Lantern number two. Uh, exciting issue. Uh, picks up right where we left off with Hal uh, getting his ring charged. It starts out from the the perspective of the Coast City Police. And they're they're like, who are we gonna call? And he's like, I called the FBI, and I I called you know everybody. I even tried calling this Booster Gold guy. And so I was about to say, did you try the Ghostbusters? When Steel Fury's body comes flying towards them and crashes, and they're like, wow, I've got no clue about it. And I thought it was neat that there was a little shout out to Marv Wolfman there. It was like, what just happened, Marv? Mm-hmm. And no clue, Donnie. I don't know who he's referring to as Donnie, but Marv, I, I'm I'm thinking as Marv Wolfman. 
I would think so. Yeah. But the next section of the book is is just Hal exploring the ring because this again this takes place a couple months ago or one month ago, and Hal is just experiencing the joy of having his ring. There's this rapture on his face. He's happy because again he's been in this place, this situation where Earth has passed him by, time has passed him by since he's been on Earth, and he doesn't seem to fit in. And now. He suddenly feels like I have purpose again because I have my ring and he's flying and he's, he's talking with the bird, which I thought was, was great. Uh, and then he's like, well, I gotta see what else this ring can do. And he sees, as he's looking around, he sees the demolition team. And for those that don't know, the demolition team was a group of villains, like, you know, B level C tier villains that Len Wein created back in the eighties. It was 1984. And uh, based partially on, I, I'm sure he drew inspiration from the Wrecking Crew, which he designed over at Marvel. Uh, but they show up. So it was neat for Jeremy Adams to, to do kind of a callback to the demolition team that I thought was very nostalgic. I mean, nobody needs to know who they are to enjoy this story. But if you do, it's just it's a neat little touch. But uh, he sees the opportunity for some hijinks and proceeds to scare them. I love the bits where he's. He's talking about, well, you know, Batman talks about the superstitious and cowardly lot. And then he does mm-hmm. this whole, I am the vengeance, I am the night thing. Is he has this, this construct, this gorgeous, gorgeous construct of these ghosts in the cemetery, which I just, I was loving it. I don't know about you. I, I felt like a throwback to Spectre when he said that. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then these constructs kind of look like something that the, that the Spectre would make. That's a, that's a great observation. Mm. Uh, he he scares them off. He doesn't actually interact with them a whole lot, other than to scare the the garbage the crap out of them. And they go run right into the cops. And he's like, you know, hey, you know, it, it, I, you know how I've missed high jinks. <laughs> and uh, so he starts heading up towards the atmosphere and just heading towards space. And just as he gets near the edge of the atmosphere, the ring craps out. And that's a uh, cool shot too. I like how the shading is done with the with the clouds. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I really thought that neat. was really pretty. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, we see from Hal's perspective, above Hal's perspective, looking down on him, the ring peers out and he starts falling. And then we jump forward in time. So we know obviously Hal gets out of it in some fashion. We just don't know how. Uh, but we go back to present day, and Hal is on his motorcycle going back to the trailer, and he's there and he's greeted by Kilowog. And Kilowog gives him a bit of a pep talk. talk. And, and again, another great character scene because we see Hal being a little more open than he usually is. You know, Hal's pretty guarded with his emotions. And here he kind of brings some of it out. And and Kilowog gives him a swift kick in the pants. Uh, I, I thought that was really cool. Uh, bar flats is now my favorite fake swear word. I know. I'm going to teach it to Clark. <laughs> <laughs> could go around calling people bar flats and be like what is that <laughs> uh that was cool i love the whole thing about the the dew of the mountain tasting like enduring puddle water I, again it just fun it's lighthearted. It, it captures the dynamic between these two because i think there's a very special relationship between hal and kilowak i think there always has been i always remember yeah. back to that uh that one issue where he's holding kilowak on the you know, he's kind of cradling out. It, just... it's, it's it's funny you say that. Yeah. I have that gr- graphic set up to show later on when we do our next segment. That's a graphic I was going to put up there. But yeah, mm-hmm. the whole thing when the whole Hal Renegade arc, when when mm-hmm. Kilowog is like, you know, if you're going to go out there, you got to be able to get through me first. And they have that, that fight and they're embracing each other while Hal's kind of holding Kilowog up. Uh, it it really encapsulates their relationship. And of course, you had the relationship between the two of these characters in Greenland and the animated series. And we know that Jeremy Adams wrote a couple of those episodes. So he's very familiar with, with the dynamic that the two of these characters can have with each other. Uh, but I just thought it was really a, a nice, it was a nice character scene. You know, you empathize with Hal in a way. And then we jump forward. And uh, the next day after that, Hal is at Ferris aircraft and he's the co-pilot on Carol Ferris's private plane. And she's about to get on the plane with Nathan, her, her boyfriend, last issue, fiance, this issue. Right. Right. You know how cheesy how looks when he's all dressed up. And <laughs> you know, he's got I, saw, I was like, what a cheesy look, man. He, <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and it's neat. There's a, this neat panel they show where 
we see how Hal got relegated to the mailroom. So he didn't lose his job, but he got busted from being a pilot and he's in the mailroom at, you know, eight o'clock in the morning. And by five 30 in the afternoon, he's a pilot again, which yeah. I thought was your know, typical charismatic Hal charming his way up the ladder rather quickly. Uh, I, I thought that was really cute. Fast tracking to beat the red tape. I mean, he, went <laughs> That's right right. Through, he went right through everything. That's right. That's and, hilarious. uh, so of course Carol is not happy to see him wearing a uh, a uniform, and uh, Hal's inserting himself with Nathan, and Nathan isn't picking up on the vibe. They're they're getting along like buddies here in the beginning, and uh, then it, and then, and this is where I can see there there's some criticism. Hal's watching what's going on back in the the cabin where Carol and Nathan are, and they're about to get chummy with some champagne and Hal causes some turbulence and makes him spill his drink on himself. And then when he goes back to the bathroom to clean up, Hal walks back there to check on the passengers and locks the door so that he, Nathan can't get out. So he can be alone with Carol. And I can see where it it's, it's over the line. Carol's moved on. She's got a relationship. She's engaged. Um, and, and we'll get to that in a minute too. Uh, but how it kind of crosses a boundary there. I mean, what's your, what's your thought? I mean, I don't see no harm. And I mean, okay. I mean, I get where it's cringeworthy, but at the same time, I mean, I don't know. I just, I feel like it's one of those types of moves that a, a, a guy would do in a situation like that. I, I mean, I hate to say, I, I, it sounds like something that Hal would do. I mean, it's, it seemed like a, like one of his suave moves that's supposed to be, this is me being smooth. Well, yeah, but, and he, go ahead, go ahead. But at the same time, you know, objectively looking at it, it's like, yeah, it's kind of creepy. You know, I get it. It's kind of, you know, it's kind of over line, you know, I don't know. It's. I think if you take it outside of the scope of the history that these two characters have, if this was somebody that how barely knew, I'd really say this is over the line. Yeah, that but I would agree with. Hal seen Carol engaged three times and married once. Right. over the course of their 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 years together so does he look at this as yeah she's not really i know her well enough to know she's not really into this guy this is just it's mr right now right you know he's not mr right he's mr right now and it just seems like a typical move of his you know or something to that effect yeah well and and then the one thing that kind of it bugged me was she did this whole but but hal he doesn't leave and i was like you know if you and I did a whole episode on the history of Carol Ferris and the relationship, and it was, and the whole point of the episode was, is Carol the right person for Hal? And and we both said, yeah, she is. But it's moments like this when it's like, you know, she's not. Right. <laughs> you know, when we looked at the history uh, of things with Hal and Carol, Carol has always been the one that has dumped Hal tried to pressure him on leaving the core and leaving his responsibilities behind. And Hal has always been true to her, even though she has on multiple occasions just broke things off with him for no apparent reason and starts dating somebody else or gets engaged to somebody else. I mean, at one point she was dating a villain right. uh, that she didn't know was a villain. You know, so the, the history between these two characters are, are that, they they love each other. They are meant for each other. And if Hal had never gotten the ring, they'd have been married long ago. And it would have been a fine relationship. But the ring is almost a curse for Hal. You know, it's almost like it's almost like Spider-Man and the curse of, of being Spider-Man back in those those old issues. This is kind of the same thing. Hal Hal has this this great burden and this great responsibility, and he loves doing it, but it also means He's going to be gone for a while. In, in my written review, I made a comment about how Lois Lane knows that she's always going to be second fiddle to the rest of the world when it comes to Superman and, and Clark. Yet she doesn't say to Clark, well, you need to quit being Superman to be mm -hmm. with me. She realizes how important it is. And this is just a, someone who's got all of these superpowers, but he's pretty much restricted to Earth most of the time. Hal is responsible for policing an entire sector of space. So 
you under you know she understands that but yet she still thinks that she should come above all of that and she can't she's not emotionally mature enough to let go of that piece and let him do the things that he needs to do and still you can still have a relationship and after spending all that time that she spent as star sapphire away from earth herself what a hypocrite <laughs> true i was noting too that you know i mean lois lane and and, and carol ferris are two Oh yeah. Very different characters. And, you know, and you brought up a good point about how like Lois doesn't ever, you know, ride Superman's ass about, you know, Oh, you're flying off to do this in the middle of while we're doing this and yada, yada, yada. But Carol has always been on Hal's tale about it. Mm -hmm. But I think that just, that just arrives from Carol's character. I think she wants to come first. And I mean, right. Right. To be quite honest with you. I mean, she, she deserves that. Right. Or at well, least, at least the uh, the illusion of coming first, maybe to to gain her approval to win mm-hmm. to get Hal back in her life. She she was off in space for quite some time during the from Blackest Night on as a Star Sapphire, and yeah. left Earth behind and left Ferris Air behind, and somebody else had to run it. And that was okay when it was her. <laughs> the double standards, right? Exactly, exactly, and. And let's not even get into the whole Carol and Kyle thing, you know. Oh God. <laughs> but that, that's cringe. To me, this whole this whole wimpy, you know, he doesn't leave thing. I'm just like, grow up. Um <laughs> not to justify what Hal does is is any better. Well, it's like a, at the end of the day, it's like, how long how long has he done this for? I mean, don't right. you think by now you've you you've known that's his MO? Exactly. <laughs> Haven't you gotten over it? And, and 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 if that's the fact, then just don't talk to the man anymore. Right. I mean, if you really have that big of an issue, right. just don't answer his texts. You know, don't hire him back. Right. But she can't because the thing is, is deep down, that's who she loves. You yeah. know that that's the thing about the relationship is the, is is that the Hal and Carol relationship is is very tragic when you yeah. look at it from 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 the lens that. Because of this ring, Hal can't have a normal life. And That's true. It, you know, as Jeremy Adams said, Carol is also home for Hal. So Hal is back here fleeing lost. He's looking for he's looking for some emotional intimacy. He's looking for something that lets him know it's okay. And she's it. You know, he's really other than Kilowog, um, Hal doesn't seem to have anybody. He's, he hasn't talked to Ollie. He hasn't talked to Barry. He hasn't talked to any of the rest of, of his super friends. <laughs> um, no, none of the other Landrons are around. He's not having no. a conversation with John Stewart on the regular. No, well, you nobody know, knows where John is. You know, that's right. He's not talking to Kyle Rayner. No, no. So, I'm you, man, maybe Simon Baz is his buddy somewhere. <laughs> well, the thing is, dial. the thing is, is they're all he because he doesn't have an official core ring. He can't communicate with them in any way, shape, or form. And That's they've true. all been assigned to other sectors. Um, but the, the cool thing I, I I liked at the end of it is after we get past this whole thing, uh, the pilot calls Hal to the front because there's all of these creatures and ghosts and specters in the sky, which ties us right into the night terrors, which I thought was okay. You know, you're in the second issue of a new series. The last thing you really want to do is, is divert off and do this event when you're just trying to establish momentum. But it looks like Jeremy Adams, even though we're getting a night terrors, green lantern, two issue mini series, it's like the plot is going to continue with just a slight little detour because it's still connected back to the main story. Well, as long as, like we always said, as long as it's tied in, you know, yeah, it makes yeah. sense to have a tie back. Um, Zermanico's art is off the charts. Mm-hmm. Uh, the yeah. coloring, as you pointed out, is fantastic. Uh, there's another page here that, of text, and it was funny. I bought this book originally digitally because uh, my comic shop does not open up on Tuesdays, and I, I was like, I got to read this on Tuesday. So I bought the digital version, and people were posting uh, pictures of this page online, and I was like, my copy doesn't have that. For some reason, it was taken out. I think, uh, as you as I were saying off mic, that maybe somebody thought it was a full page ad and they removed it. But Probably. Uh, it goes a little bit into the quarantine, but at the bottom of the page is this internal affairs memorandum. And it talks about, you know, Sinestro, uh, location unknown, advise, how Jordan's status inactive. 
energy source detected. So they're aware that there's some kind of an energy source associated with Hal. Uh, redacted, deceased, former Lantern Jordan's field report. John Stewart, location unknown, which we do know about. Cal Rayner, redacted, field report, very mysterious there. And then it says all other 2814 lanterns have been reassigned. You know, it's funny. It's so, kind of like a, a month ago we talked about our there was that common uh, argument about there. there's so many Earth lanterns, right? And everybody's talking about there's too many Earth lanterns. What are they going to do with so many Earth lanterns? This is what they do with so many Earth lanterns. <laughs> <laughs> All other 2814 lanterns reassigned. I mean, yeah. that's how you clear the field. You know, I mean, yeah. if, you, if you're going to look at it one way to bring them back in the fold, you kind of got to have a clearinghouse to get, to get back to, I mean, maybe down the line, when, when you start introducing other core members but if you think about it like this i mean there's there's no there's no semblance of oa anymore you know the right. central batteries whatever it is is gone the guardians are who knows where so you got the united planets running things now and so the, i think the lantern mythos in, in, in a nutshell is kind of in a flux right now until it until it I guess eventually at some point it'll realign itself. But right. Well, it's it, to get there. The two interesting things mentioned is Kyle Rayner redacted. What does that mean? Yeah. Because it says all other 2814 lanterns reassigned. So that implies that Kyle Rayner wasn't reassigned. So what's going on with Kyle? Not sure. And then the deceased lantern. Right, which it says former Lantern Jordan field report. Right, which tells us that that their their information comes from a field report that Hal filed before he quit. Right, uh, but it doesn't say whether this is a Green Lantern. Is it a, is it a Yellow Lantern? It doesn't say who that is. Um, but we'll get to that in a little bit. <laughs> Breadcrumbs. <laughs> Breadcrumbs. Uh, so that was the Hal Jordan part of the book. I I thoroughly enjoyed it. I I get the how cross the line thing. Cause I feel that way a little bit too. Uh, but I think there's other reasons for it, which we'll get to again, another breadcrumb. <laughs> uh, but anyway, we jump forward over a little bit to the, the John Stewart portion of the book. And we're seeing more information about the Revenant queen. And um, then it jumps back to earth. And, and I loved the scene between John and his mother. Yeah. It's a really, it's a really nice serene scene. I mean, of course, it's funny because it's juxtaposed right next to a, like a hell storm going on. On the next <laughs> right, right, right. But what what I really liked was when we talked to Philip Kennedy Johnson, he talked about how hard it is when you're in the military to shut it off. You know, because you're 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 in an environment when you're stationed somewhere where where you're on high alert, your emotions are running high. You're 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 running in tenth gear all the time, and then you come back down to try to live a normal life when you when you come back. And it's hard to shut all that off. And he and he really does a nice job of talking about how uh, John's feeling like, you know, every, he's waiting every minute for things to start blowing up again. I and, mean, that I would assume that would be a, a, a military mindset. Yeah, I mean, very much I, so. I've, I'm not military, but I've known enough to know that that's how they feel. I mean, it's kind of like, I mean, a small comparison would be like if you lived in a part of a city that's really, really crime ridden. Mm -hmm. And then you move some someplace else, and then you're like, "Well, I'm a little uneasy now because I'm I'm used to stuff happening around me all the time." You just you're adjusting to a new way of living, and military people don't do that so easily. Yeah, well, and and I liked his mother's reaction to this. Her observation, you know, that's it's a very motherly observation to be paying attention to your child and noticing how they're acting, and. I just, I, it felt very organic, very natural, which I, I just, I, I really liked those two pages better than all the cosmic action stuff, just because it, it it's, I don't know, it's, it's grounded in reality. Uh, it, it shows the relationship and the dynamic between a mother and a son. And it, it helps establish John's character a little bit more that, that he is always on alert. It is hard for him. When, when you're a Green Lantern and you're on call 24-7, there is no downtime. 
Mm-hmm. And someone like John who takes this responsibility, so much is the core of his being. It's hard for him to shut it down. So even relaxing, he's not relaxing. Yeah, because he's still in his forethought. Yeah. So I, I thought that was really good. And, and we jump back to the other universe and we see the Green Lantern Shepherd trying to fight his own against the Revenant Queen. And he's about to, to succumb to things. And their version of Jon Stewart shows up. And that's how the issue ends. Again, another another great splash at the end, uh, showing John show up. And I like how he showed up coming out of that portal. Yeah. It's yeah. kind of like came out like a Terminator, you know? Good analogy. Good analogy. Yeah. And and again, Matos, uh, the art is spectacular. Yeah, he does a really good job with John. I mean, yeah. I mean, that last run with John, some of the art was a little bit finicky, but well, I mean, just the contrast in styles, the, the way he contrasts the scenes at home and how serene it is, and you know how how bright it is, and then when you compare that to what's going on in the other timeline, the other universe where it's very hectic it's very dark um it, it shows a lot of range yeah what did you think of shepherd's new look at the end i liked it i thought it was kind of cool yeah he's kind of cut i wonder i wonder if that's guy if, if that's going to be a common character is going to come back yeah i Shepard. don't know i mean they're spending a lot of time with him um i'm not wondering a Green lantern that i'm familiar with no no he's he's a brand new character right uh in this other this other universe uh it'll be interesting to see what happens with it uh i i there's only one more issue where it's a backup oh that's so, it that's one more yeah because the net for the next two issues it's night terrors and there is no backup in those two issues that'll bring us to september it'll have a backup in green lantern right before the launch of green lantern war journal war journal yeah yep so then it then it goes off on its own so it's only for three issues so it's for coming. those for those, there were some, there were some John Stewart fans who were like, you know, gosh, how long do we have to have the backup when we get our when we get the actual thing? We now know that, and it's really only three issues that that there's the backup. Well, there you go, John fans. That wasn't so bad of a wait. No, not at all. And I I have so much confidence in this these two creative teams. I think they're both going to be gangbusters books. I think they're going to be fantastic. I I firmly agree on that. I would like to see. Uh, some fairness being thrown out to like maybe Gardner and Rainer down the line. I, I I certainly would like to see some other lanterns come into the fold, you know, and maybe that's part of their plan. Maybe it's not, you know, and that's their business, not mine. I don't care, but it would just, that's a wish list of mine would to, to be, to see some of those guys come back in the fold again. I, I still think a green lantern quarterly or bi-monthly book, that had spot for all of these characters to have their own stories ongoing would be fine. If they're going to be in other sectors, that's fine, but we can still tell stories about. Them. So why not? Right. So that's one wish list I have. But yep. other than that, I think these guys are going to really take this. I mean, their their writing's great. I mean, Adam's writing is just it's fresh. It it it's uh, it's succinct. You know, it's like both issues. I mean, while while I didn't sit there and like delve in hard to the issues, they were just they were a smooth read, you know, without any challenges that said, you know, I mean, if I had to draw a comparison like Grant Morrison's, you know, where you it was pretty complex, so you had to delve through it a couple different times, or even some of the paragraphs you had to reread a couple different times to understand context. And I'm not saying I'm not saying that Adams isn't a complex writer, but those two styles are pretty different. And then if you really put in the last run in there, it to me, that storyline felt like it was just, it felt like a bomb went off and different pieces of the story were landing in different places and different issues throughout that entire year. <laughs> yeah. With, with the Morrison run, it was very dense. Yeah. Um, intellectually dense. And, and you, you had to kind of reread some things to really understand what was going on because it wasn't straightforward storytelling in a lot of ways. Right. Uh, with this, it, it's... It's, I don't want to say it's simpler because it's not simpler, but it's certainly easier to digest. And it's on track to make it a proper, a proper Green Lantern type of book. Yeah. If that makes sense. You know, I mean, not that I'm, I'm not saying that the last one wasn't or Morrison's wasn't, but it, it seems like this is something that Green Lantern fans need. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think this is what I think this is what exactly the kind of book that fans were looking for. Right. And you know, there it, it has the three core elements of adventure, heart, and humor. Yeah. Uh, it, it's got it in spades. So I, I couldn't ask for anything better. Really, I'm very yeah. very happy with it. Me too, man. I mean, two issues in and two solid issues too. This wasn't, you know, this is a solid issue, and it. it I like how it's going to lead into Night Terrors, and I hope that Night Terrors has some kind of uh, um, reverberations through the DC universe afterwards. Right. It'd be nice to have an event that actually means something, right? Yeah, you know, just have some fallout from it, not just something that oh, it's an event. Okay, let's go back to our coffee now. You know, right, right, right. <laughs> but uh, so we've got an elephant in the room to talk about. All right. So we'll we'll come back after a break. If if you're sensitive to it and you, you don't want to know what this speculation is, um, please by all means skip skip the next section. Not that I want you to not watch and listen, but if 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 it really would bother you to maybe hear what might be going on in the background of the story, then don't don't. <laughs> the la- the last thing you know we we're, we want to we want to enhance your your fan experience, not spoil it. But at the same time, we think there's something big going on and we got to talk about it. Sure. And they know where to hit the stop button. They That's right. To listen. All right. We'll be right back. All right. Welcome back. So we have a bit of a theory and we're not the only ones to have this theory. Uh, I got to give all credit to Chad Bolkman over the Lantern cast because he's the first one to have spoken about it publicly. Uh, he he had, you know, when they were talking about the first issue in the conversation with Hal and Kilowog, he was, they were conjecturing about some different things and he threw out the idea, well, maybe Kilowog is dead. And I had kind of, when I, and, and we didn't, we, neither one of us have listened to their coverage because we're, we're sister shows, but we want to make sure we have unique voices. We don't parrot each other. And I'm not sure if they listen to our show or not, um, but I intentionally, when recovering the same material, I don't for a, you know, a while afterwards, and I'll go back and listen to what they had to say because I, I don't want to a inadvertently parrot something that they've done or change what I've been thinking because of what somebody else is saying. So I, I intentionally don't do this. I, I had not listened to the show, but I remember reading the first issue and and. I, there was something about this series that back when it was announced, one of the things they said was that um, the, you know, the PR blurb they had for this series was included a number of things, but one of them said a heartbreaking defeat has set Hal reeling returning home to rediscover his roots. So when I read the first issue, I'm like, okay, he had a heartbreaking defeat and I'm reading the issue. I'm like, well, there's really what heartbreaking defeat. He doesn't seem impacted by anything. And then I started thinking about the Kilowog thing. I'm like, well, why is he, you know, why is he on his own and having a fake conversation with Kilowog and making up a voice for Kilowog when Ollie, well, Ollie's missing and Barry's not around necessarily, but he'd go talk to Superman or he'd talk to somebody, right? Uh, and then it, it, it entered my head like, well, is the heartbreaking loss because something happened? And he lost someone close to him. That would be devastating for Hal because when you look at Hal, he would rather throw him. He always likes to throw himself into danger first because he would rather take the brunt of it than somebody else take the brunt of it. And right. it would impact him if somebody close to him died. And he hasn't really had that happen. So I started thinking, well, gosh, you know, maybe maybe it's Kilowog. That would be devastating to him. But I didn't go anywhere with it. In fact, I didn't say anything to you about it. I didn't say anything on the air about it because I was like, eh, you know. Well, then this issue came out. And I'm thinking, okay, how did Kilowog get there? If Sector 2814 is quarantined, 2814 is quarantined, how did Kilowog show up? He couldn't have his power ring. He doesn't have it on. And if he was on Earth, he would have been talking to Hal in the first issue. So then I start thinking, well, okay, that's really weird. Not to mention he just kind of appears and then he just kind of disappears. Yeah, and we only see him in that one scene. We only see him when he's alone with Hal. Mm-hmm. And then you get to you get to this page, and it's like, okay, if Kilowog was on Earth and he were alive, 
he'd have been listed. And because otherwise, why, why do we care about Sinestro? You know? Um, and then I was like, redacted deceased. Former Lantern Jordan field report. And I'm thinking, okay. So how I had to report in a field report about the death of someone. It doesn't say it's a Green Lantern, but now these things are starting to add up. Mm-hmm. And and Hal is, if he's acting a little cringy, is it because he's grieving and he doesn't have a way to process the grief? And so he's supplementing things by making up a conversation with Kilowog. Now he's actually imagining that Kilowog is physically there. Is Hal, because he's so desperate, he's so alone, he doesn't have any friends. He's imagining Killer because Killer is one of his only friends. Uh, is is Hal overreaching and trying to get close to Carol because she's one of the few people that's on Earth that he has any emotional intimacy with and can help and, him with the grieving process? And she does kind of ground him in a certain degree. Right, right. And it sounds like something that he needs right now. It does. And for, for more reasons than one, but I, I'm i like, if there's a devastating loss, what the heck was it? Because we haven't heard anything about it. And it sounds like that was going to be a major plot point. Well, uh, not only that, if you think about it, if it's a, if it's a de- devastating loss, you would have <clears throat> you would have signs of said loss in subsequently that you would be reading about. Right. So if you're going to backtrack to issue one and two, the only anomaly is Kilowog. Right. It, it it to me it adds up, uh, and it sounds like it adds up to you. And I I think it certainly does to Chad. It was funny when this issue came out. I I posted this little blurb about the deceased part at the bottom. I mentioned that this was really an important thing, and he he responded to my tweet and said, "Was I right?" And of course, because I hadn't listened to it, I didn't know what he was talking about. So I messaged him. I DM'd him on Twitter, and I was like, "Oh, who do you think is deceased?" And he says, "Kilowog." And I go. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking too. So we, he and I exchanged a little bit of a dialogue on Twitter, DMing back and forth. And we both have the same theory that Kilowog is dead. And this is how trying to cope as he's going through the grieving process, but he doesn't have anybody to help him through it. And are we going to, through these series of flashbacks back and forth, when Hal finally gets the chance to have a conversation with Carol, will it come out? You know that I, I the, the one of the examples I gave to Chad in our DMs back and forth. Um, some some people who are listening or watching the show may not remember Mash, the TV show Mash, mm-hmm. uh, but there was a there was a very powerful sequence in the last episode of Mash where Hawkeye Pierce is at a psychiatrist's office and he's recounting uh, an episode that occurred in Korea near the end of their stint in Korea, where he's on a bus with a bunch of refugees and it's getting you know there's there's the enemy is circling and this woman is holding a chicken and the chicken keeps clucking loudly and hawkeye keeps telling the woman would you please keep your chicken quiet because it's going to get us all killed and through the therapeutic process it suddenly is revealed that it wasn't a chicken it was her baby and she'd smothered it because of Hawkeye and killed her own child. And Hawkeye was carrying this tremendous guilt and, and and grief over the incident. And I'm like, well, is this what's going on with Hal? Is he, is he thinking that Kilowog is there because he hasn't, he can't really accept that Kilowog died. You know, are we going to get some big emotional scene where Hal, it just comes tumbling down. You know what I mean? Well, not only that, but how, like you know where how, when did this happen you know when how right. did it take place i i would also argue that sinestro you know him being on earth i mean he could have something to do with it oh yeah he could very well have something to do with that process you know? yeah so, Acor- according to the according to the whole pure blurb sinestro is the cause of it well see so and so, if he's hiding out on earth right I, i'm waiting for either Either there's going to be a confrontation between Hal and Sinestro and Carol's there to witness it, or Carol is going to get fed up and say something to Hal that's going to trigger it. That would be a good one. Is, is what I'm seeing in my head. Uh, 
we could be completely wrong. It could, it could, it could mean something completely different, but right now that's, I, I'm, I'm firmly, you know, I, I feel like this is the sixth sense and we're, we're not, you know, people aren't seeing the signs and we'll get to that point where we'll find out that Bruce Willis's character is dead. Um, spoiler for sixth sense. If you haven't seen it. Uh, Cause then when you rewatch the movie, like, Oh my gosh, the signs were there all along. Right. And I think this is the same thing. It. Cause it yeah. just totally, yeah. Cause once that movie, once that revelation comes, it's just going to like, mm -hmm. you know, I don't think I ever watched that movie after that first time I watched that movie. I watched it. I watched it to, to look at all the evidence. Oh, I see. That makes sense. Um, I wanted to see how, how from a storytelling perspective. And the, one of the things that I, I think Jeremy Adams is a very, very good writer and realizes um, something that I hear J. Michael Straczynski talk about a lot. And like if he, he worked on murder, she wrote for a number of years and he was saying, you can't have a mystery where when you find out who committed the murder, it's a gotcha. And the viewer didn't see the clues. The viewer has to be able to solve the crime. Just like the main character does. Sure. You can't do a, a gotcha. And if he's building up to this emotional thing, he's got to leave some breadcrumbs. Otherwise it's going to be a gotcha. That makes sense. And I, I would honestly say that, that's what he's doing then if he's following that narrative it, it's it's what i'm going with right now we'll see we'll see when the, after these next two issues are done uh what happens but if hal's acting more assertive than usual i think it's because he's he's being driven by grief and the desperation that he's alone and he's got this burden on his mind and doesn't know how to process it well, that would be enough to that would be enough for a driving factor too. You know, especially given his complex history. <laughs> Absolutely. You know? I mean and trauma in itself. I mean, he's I mean, he's probably suffering from PTSD too, you know. And sure, sure. For all for all we know, Adam's just writing this whole thing, you know, and he's got a lot of suppressed memories and stuff's not coming back just yet. You know, and sooner or later it could, you know, in spades. So anyway, that's the theory. That's and again, I, I I have to give credit to Chad because he's he's the one that first came out with and mentioned it publicly. Um, uh, but that's that's the theory. Um, so let's jump back and we'll wrap up the episode. We gotta talk about what we're doing next because we got a couple of exciting things coming up. Blue. You can become a part of the show by leaving a message up to one minute long on our voicemail line. Call us at 406 pod of OA. That's 406 763-6362. You can also email us at podcast at blogofoa.com. We'd love to hear from you. All right, man. Issue number two of Green Lantern. So I'm going to go back to what I said or what I've said about previous runs. Usually the first issue you can get a tell, you know, mm -hmm. like, you know, okay, feels good. Doesn't feel good. Whatever. It's, it could be something small. It could be something big. Depends on the reader. You know, I would I would say by issue two, you know, usually if if if, if that's extended and, and your feeling gets extended that okay, well it looks like there's more added to it, then I feel like your your narrative and your and your arc is going in the right direction. So I mean obviously I usually don't know a lot until maybe issue four. Then I'm like, okay, but that's only because a lot of stuff has been nullified and wrapped up in the first few issues, you know? So, um, but for all intents and purposes, this looks like it's going in a great direction, especially with uh, the John Stewart book um, coming out later, which I hope those two will have a find a way to intertwine. Yeah. I, I imagine at some point there's going to be more interactions. I think right now they're trying to tell stories about these characters that are unique to them. And, and that's fine. That's, that's totally fine. But I do expect at some point they're going to intercross with each other somewhere down the road. Going to have to. Now, and I wonder if this is going to go towards a uh, a spot where it's going to be to have to restart the core. You know what I mean? Like, right. Well, you know, will the Guardians come back and they've got to take things back away from them, from the United Planets or whatever? I don't know. Right. We'll see. We'll see. So. We were going to be doing our GL June episode next, 
uh, where we do the circle of fire stuff. But we just got an email today and we are recording an interview with two creators next week. So I, I, I'm not sure. One of the things we don't know is when we can release those, those interviews because they're timed with it, with an event. Uh, but <laughs> so we're either going to be a, another episode next week with a couple of interviews or the week after we're going to have GL June. Either, there's either going to be an episode next week with the interviews or, or not, but either way, GL June will be the last week of the month. Uh, because we've got a, there's only so much we can, recording we can do in a week, and uh, I know you're off from work for the summer, but I'm still working a full time job, <laughs> and uh, my wife and I are going out of town for for an extended weekend, so uh, I've got to f- figure out all of all of that. But I, I I'm excited. Uh, I, I'm ex- I'm talking about the interviews like they're an inconvenience. They're not. This is another great opportunity, and and we can't pass it up. There's just no way. No, um, no, it's got to be done, and I'm looking yeah. forward to it. We've, yeah, yeah, me too. Uh, it should be very good, but I don't know whether we're going to be able to release that episode at right after we record it, or if we're going to have to bank it. So we'll we'll figure that piece out when we get more information from the person setting it up and it, that reached out to us. Uh, and, and then, like I said, we've got jail June because we've committed to that, and we're definitely doing that. So there's definitely at least one more episode in June, possibly two, depends on the, the timingness of it all. Right. So get your uh, headphones on. We've got some listening to do. <laughs> and, and, and I hope uh, we, we've gotten a pretty good number of listens uh, on the podcast itself, but the number of video views is, is it's growing. So that's exciting. And it's hard to judge because we had those two interviews and that obviously draws more, li- more views than just you and I talking because we're nobody. <laughs> right. Exactly. Uh, but, but a, a fair number of, of views uh, when, when you think about, in terms of podcasting, they say if you get more than two hundred listens, you're doing good. You're better than you're doing better than half the podcasts that are out there, and we generally do that anyway. But we're we're getting about that many in views and that many more in listens. Our our listen our our, our audio version has not dropped significantly at all with going to the video format. If anything, our audience is getting bigger. So that to me is that's telling me it's all the right things. That's good. That's a good sign. Yep, absolutely. So friends, thanks for joining us for another episode of the podcast of OA. We'll be back in about a week or so. Until next time, keep that power ring charged, treat each other well, and make every day your brightest day. Take care. Thanks so much for watching this Green Lantern video from the blog of OA. If you liked what you saw, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can find even more great Green Lantern videos, reviews, podcasts, and more at our main website, www.blogofoa.com. So until next time, keep your power ring charged and make every day your brightest day.